Okay, hi everyone. I've been busy working on this new book and finally it is published now. The new book is Debunking the Simultaneity Paradox and Solving the Double Slit Experiment. So I just had a couple videos about this and I decided to write it out more fully and put it into book form. And the full title is actually, if we escape that, um, yes, Reclaiming Reason in Physics with Applied Ontological Mathematics. So humanity, let's just zoom in on this blurb, humanity has suffered from cognitive disparity in science for over 100 years since the time that the simultaneity paradox was first introduced by Einstein. Uh, this paradox sent modern scientific thinking into a tailspin of cognitive dissonance from which it has never recovered. It is time for ontological mathematics to demonstrate some practical applications and to begin healing the error. So a lot of people probably might not even realize that the uh, simultaneity paradox is a problem, but that's where... Uh, paradoxical irrational thinking actually got introduced into science in the first place and uh, a practical application one thing that I've really wanted ontological mathematics to do for a long time is to demonstrate how to solve the double slit experiment without you know these crazy interpretations from quantum mechanics and uh, the Copenhagen school interpretation of quantum mechanics and so I decided to finally uh, just do that and so it's a really fun uh, really nice, uh, fun read. Yeah, uh, nice application. And I think from this, uh, you know, we're basically solving quantum mechanics, right? So imagine the, imagine the power you're going to have over reality uh, in solving quantum mechanics. It's going to give you quite a bit of power uh, technologically. Um, you know, you know, I always mention the technological aspect, but you know, there's a whole spiritual aspect, of course, uh, to ontological mathematics and illuminism as well, right? You know, we're talking about technological applications is usually what I refer to, but uh, what we really actually are want to pursue is our own uh, spiritual gnosis, right? And, uh, you know, it's not clear even what that means, uh, but, you know, we, in theory, we should be able to develop, you know, spiritual powers ourselves that give us, you know, sort of Jesus-like powers over reality and of course uh, there's also Simon Simon Magus Simon Magus uh, who was you know contemporary of Jesus and uh, you know another you know people like that examples from history who had uh, real spiritual powers over over their reality of course we don't want to create uh, <laughs> you know a situation where there's some psychopathic Sith overlords or something who uh, who have that power and use it well I, actually that's already happening we're already living in a world where there's psychopathic Sith overlords who are using that power to enslave the rest of us that's the world we actually do live in uh, so um, in any case I think that we can break that hold uh, with some technical technological applications um, in the book I mentioned the Institute for uh, uh, what is it um, the Institute for Applied Ontological Mathematics. So that is something that I would like to develop and we could start developing uh, some basic technologies uh, initially. And I have some, a few ideas for where we could go with that. Um, kind of have no idea where to start, but we should be able to get it figured out. <laughs> um, it looks like it's up to us, right? So that's what we're going to do. Um, yeah, just on the issue of cognitive disparity, so I, this is actually inside the book. I put this meme inside the book, but this is this Yuri uh, Bezmanov guy, uh, apparently a former KGB spy. This was recorded in 1984. This is a good interview. You should watch this whole interview. You can find it online. Just search. Uh, I'm sure it's on YouTube. I'm sure it's on anywhere you can, you know, any sort of video service. Uh, so 1984, these are the year Yuri Bezmanov. Re listen to this whole interview. It's fascinating. It really explains a lot of, you know, what we're, facing, and this is what I've been facing in science, is what we have in science, but anyway, listen to this quote. Uh, they are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind, even if you present them with an authentic information. So for example, on the climate alarm issue, right? So I can show them, guys, look, climate alarm is based on this flat earth theory, and it does nothing. It does nothing to them. You know, you can show them authentic, you know, authentically here are the references, here's the how the derivation works, here's what you're doing in the math. It's all comes down to this diagram. Well, look at this diagram. What does this diagram have on it? It has a flat line for the whole earth. It's literally flat earth theory. It's literally working out the math for flat earth theory and it does nothing to them. It, you cannot change the basic perception and logic of their behavior. The process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. So 
uh, I would rephrase that as the process of irrationalization is complete and irreversible. They are locked into an irrationalization state, a cognitive a state of cognitive disparity is what they're locked into. They're locked into a state of cognitive dissonance. This has come about through the introduction of the simultaneity paradox and the way that it's taught to students. And so we get rid of that. I, I'm getting rid of that in this book. And then from the simultaneity paradox and its irrational style of thinking, uh, that is actually how quantum mechanics became developed in the Copenhagen interpretation uh, with all of its irrational uh, interpretations, which which are simply, uh, you know, make no sense at all. And then because it makes no sense at all, like I had in that quote from, from one of my previous, previous videos, the more it makes no sense or the less sense that it makes, then the midwits are like, wow, this must be really intelligent because I can't understand it, right? That's how they literally react to it. The, the midwits are like, wow, what you're saying makes no sense at all. Therefore, it must be true. Do you get, I mean, that's, that's the thinking pattern that they've been locked into. Isn't that amazing? They've been locked into a pattern of thinking that if something is ununderstandable, then it must be true. I mean, think of the control that gives you over society. And I talk about that a little bit in the book. I also have a, a little uh, section in the book about, well, forget it, just wolves versus uh, herd animals. That was kind of fun to write. Um, anyway, yeah, really amazing, right? The, this cognitive dissonance has been locked in. It's been inculcated into their minds as how they should feel. So even if you present them with authentic information, you can show it right to their face. Look, this is a flat line for the earth. It just does nothing. They're like, well, we got to do something about climate alarmism. Humans are giving pollution and the greenhouse effect. Yeah, but that's based on flat earth theory. That's flat earth theory. Yeah, well, climate alarm, climate change, and humans are pollution. You know, the, it's complete. It, it's complete and irreversible. It seems irreversible. I don't know what we're going to do. I, I hope, you know, ideally, I would love to have people who understand what I've written. You know, and there's a few that do. And thank you for the few that do. And the few that do, Mao, you're so intelligent. You're so brilliant. You're so smart. Thanks for getting, thanks for you know, you've gone through the process of healing yourself of this mental parasite. I call this a mental parasite, or it's an aspect of the mental parasite. This is how this nobetic parasite wants you to behave or wants you to think because it just gives it free access to your, well, to control over you, right? Anyway, a lot of really good stuff in this book. A lot of really good stuff. Um, I'm just scanning through the PDF copy of it. Lots of fun diagrams here. This is explaining the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and explaining what that is. It's not some spooky, weird thing where particles are undefined. Everything is defined. Everything is real. There's no such thing as a quasi reality, you know, and then I have in the book, this is from a previous video, right? Why would a photon decide to split through two slits? Like what, what would be the process, ontological process for that? How would it know? How would a photon that was going to go through this slit know to split over here just to the right distance to go through that slit as well? And if that can be true, why can't any photon from anywhere be finding slits to split itself through? If that's an ontological property of photons is that they love to split themselves through double slits, then why doesn't that happen all the time with any slits anywhere across the universe? Like there's a slit over here and, a, and one back behind me. How come a photon isn't magically knowing to go split through those slits? You know, if you just apply some logic, you know, some humorous logic uh, like that to it. And I do that in this book. Just a little bit. Yeah, why could any photon from anywhere not always be splitting and finding some slits somewhere, right? Anyway, so we get into that a little bit. Um, talk about Huygens principle. So Huygens was a, was a Dutch uh, physicist, um, mathematician, really, really brilliant guy. So he developed, he developed the way to solve this problem of diffraction mathematically, uh, but he did it with uh, um, the wrong the wrong reasoning, the, fu the wrong fundamentals, like he Im imagined that a photon, well, they didn't even know what photons were back then. So he just, you know, imagined it in terms of wave fronts like this. He created, anyway, you can read the, the details in the book, uh, ended up creating a wave front diagram like this. It ends up being that the math that he solved for this problem uh, works the exact same way for particles uh, going through a slit and bending around the around the edges of the slit. So the math is, ends up being exactly the same, although we derived it for the wrong fundamental reason. I talk about how important that is, that you can derive uh, the correct math, but you but you actually did it um, with the completely wrong uh, fundamental first principles uh, of your of your conception, right? That's, uh, that's really amazing, right? That, uh, that science can work that way. 
but now we have ontological mathematics and now we understand reality as it is in and of itself. I have some Minkowski space-time diagrams here. I didn't make the point clearly enough, perhaps in the book, that this now represents an absolute frame, but anyway, the point would be gotten across for anyone who who's actually understanding this. Yeah, we go through all the different examples of the simultaneity paradox. Here's the train and platform example. Oh yeah, this is the one with the photon emitted from the center. That was a guy named Gordon Comstock who came up with that idea. Um, this was Einstein's original flashes from either end of the train. Uh, so we go through all those examples. Oh yeah, here's the ladder through a garage example we solved. I actually show how this proves that, you know, I mean, just read it. I don't want to get into the, the details here to take too long. I didn't create a slideshow for that. <clears throat> um, just doing this ad lib. Um, so they come up with a paradoxical interpretation of this ladders uh, scenario. I mean, you'll have to read it, but you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, they go with a paradoxical interpretation, thinking that it's meaningful. And I just point out that you can actually use this to prove that space and time, <clears throat> that space time must actually be absolute. There must be an absolute frame because the interpretation they come up with makes no sense whatsoever on its own terms. And I'm, <clears throat> I'm not just saying I don't understand. I fully understand what they're saying. I just introduce a third event to this ladder paradox scenario. You know, they usually put it in terms of, oh, if the doors close on top of the ladder, they'll break the ladder. Yeah, but there's something else. What happens if the what happens if, a, if an electrical circuit was activated by both doors being closed at the same time, right? And what if that electrical circuit being activated uh, caused a very large space-time event that can't be ignored, right? So they say in one frame, both doors of the garage can be shut at the same time, but in another frame moving past, only one door is shut um, at a time and then the, and then it opens and another door is shut and so you never have a closed circuit and it, you know they don't talk about circuit that's my idea <clears throat> but they just say both realities are completely valid so from from one uh, reference frame you know both realities are completely valid you can't say that one reference frame is more valid than the other so in one reference frame the doors of the garage do not shut at the same time in another reference frame they do shut at the same time and i just point out that's not actually meaningful it's not actually a meaningful statement it's just not a meaningful statement in reality because you can connect a third event being dependent on whether or not those doors were actually shut at the same time that <clears throat> causes a space-time event which has to be uh the same event for both observers whether you're moving uh past or not anyway again the details is kind of all these paradoxical um, things that they come up with will just be discarded. And then, yeah, we solve quantum mechanics with that too. Um, yeah, oh yeah, so I went over Yuri Bezmanov already. Okay, great, yeah, so that's the title here. I'll show you what it looks like on Amazon. Yeah, so here's the Amazon page <clears throat> under my author name, of course. That's what the book looks like. I'm gonna just scroll up here. Yeah, that was just a stock Amazon uh, cover, but I really liked it because it kind of shows, um, you know, kind of like photons, light rays traveling, although I make the point in the book that, um, um, you know, that's kind of a, it, it tricks you into thinking that you can observe a photon that's traveling away from you. This is a obviously reflected light, which you see. Anyway, get into the details of that in the book because that's how the par simultaneity paradox was, was developed. Um, yeah, maybe I'm rambling a bit now. Okay, so hope you enjoy the new book. Please read it. Um, we solve relativity theory. Uh, we return space-time to being absolute. And we also begin solving quantum mechanics and all these weird interpretations that they've come up with in, uh, in quantum mechanics. We're solving that now too with ontological mathematics. Okay, everybody have a good day, good week, whatever. And thanks for everyone who comments on my videos that I don't uh, always respond to. Thanks for participating. So have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.